everybody, to episode 55 of the Pseudo Nerd Podcast for March 10th, 2017. I'm your podcast host, Josh Kaiser, and joining me today, Josh Haddix. How is everybody doing? And Kyle Hogan. Hey, hey, hey. What's going on? How you, uh, how you gents feeling doing today? Well, how, how are you doing, Mr. Sniffles? Uh, you know, hanging in there. I am currently uh, battling a little bit of a cold in a hotel in Omaha, Nebraska. So not oh. the ideal hosting conditions for a podcast, but this is what I forged through for all of the PNPers out there. Are you in a nice hotel at least? It's a Holiday Inn Express. I got a King Suite because I'm a Platinum member, so oh, it's pretty, pretty swanky in here. You know? <laughs> this guy dropping the Platinum member. <laughs> I would hope kind you are with all, all the traveling you do. Yeah, yeah, you know, they, they treat me all right, you know. It's not it's nothing special, but it's Spe- the uh, job done. Speaking of traveling, have you uh, uh, announced to the PNPers, Hoagland, that uh, we might be able to do a, a lot more in-person podcast well and that also uh kaiser's gonna have to come up with a more clever uh sign-off saying because uh the 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 golden gate is heading back to the great lake um as of july 1st i will be moving back to the cleveland area my job is pretty sweet and they're letting me move back home and work and work remotely so now we're gonna have a lot more like well actually might be able to have more often or more often than not uh, live, by live I mean like in studio recordings. Which I mean that's just going to open up the door for a lot more things that we can do. I'm sure. We're going to have to uh, find a nice place. We're going to have to find a nice studio. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, going. I'll have to put on some clothes for future podcasting. <laughs> so it's I'm not sure how I feel about this yet. It's going to ruin my closing statement uh, when we you know get out of these shows. You, you know it's going to ruin all my bandwagon banter for hoagie and his favoritism of all california teams <laughs> really kyle to be honest i'm kind of angry that you're moving home well maybe when, when all of us are, are back uh maybe with me being closer maybe i can throw you some money so you can get yourself a decent on the road mic instead of this five dollar special you're using right now uh it was a 15 dollar special thank you very much. and i think it was more so uh room for packing your mic more than not having one isn't that correct? Correct. Yeah, hey, exactly. I have a lot of equipment I got to pack in my bags, too. And it just, I didn't want to toss a nice microphone in there and risk it breaking. So I ventured for this little headset instead. So hopefully my quality doesn't sound too diminished. Um, maybe, maybe maybe something for uh, for Christmas time. Maybe we'll find out. We'll find like a more uh, mini version of a, of a decent mic that you can bring with you. Or like a, I know that a lot, a lot of guys who go on the road and do podcasts they actually bring like a mic like a like as if like they're holding like a mic in their hand and then they plug it into their into their computer that way for when they're out and about yeah that's what my boy stevie does um stone cold steve austin for those of you who don't know you know a lot of people buy by just you know oh yeah their personal yeah i mean he's under stevie and and my phone you know little pet name we got i got for him so right right next to rawls yeah rawls uh, by the way, coming up in today's podcast, we will be uh, breaking down the board game Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective West End Adventures and Jack the Ripper campaign. Uh, <laughs> so, look. So, good segue quite to a that. Mouthful, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So. Uh, and for, the, and for those that watched us on Sunday live uh, playing the game, you know why we're doing. Uh, we're doing this now because we actually played it on Twitch and on YouTube um, on our official Twitch and YouTube streaming channels. Um, that is correct. Uh, on that real quick, I did notice, Hoagie, because uh, I was looking earlier to see if it was at least on Twitch. There was like a 30-second video that has like the same picture. Um, so for anyone who is out there that is going to to watch it on Twitch, and I don't know if it's the same on YouTube. There was a second video, and it's like three hours long. That's the one you want, not the one that's like three. Thirty seconds. Yeah, I think the thirty second so, one was probably us still setting up, probably yeah, yeah, dropping f bombs. Yeah, you might want to delete that one just in case. I didn't listen to it, but 
Uh, but yeah, there is one that's like three. I know it's on Twitch. I did not check YouTube, but it is definitely on Twitch. Well, for the sake of making sure that we're not saying anything that is anti-Semitic, I'll hurry up and delete it. I'm sure everything will be fine. Uh, if nothing else, we are professional to say the least. Yes, indeed. So for this week's uh, test your knowledge, because I already kind of you know took a glimpse into our rundown of what we're talking about later, I didn't want us to talk about the same thing more than once. So with that said, uh, we're going to test Haddock's and Kaiser's knowledge on all things Sherlock Holmes. Now currently the score is Kaiser is leading three to one going into this challenge number five. Um, Haddix, I understand that it's only it's only March, but I mean, I, I feel like you need to step your game up a little bit, buddy. Dude, it's only March, okay? You, you I, just I, said I just it said yourself. That. I literally it, just it's said only March, that. bro. It's only March. This is the NBA, dude. Shit doesn't matter till the end. Okay, fair enough. But you know, being down, <laughs> I, I've never heard of a, a, a sports analogy where it's like, well, if you're, if you're down four one, that's not a big deal. <laughs> So with that said, here's how this how this one's gonna work. Uh, usually, I have you guys uh, go one at a time, like so. One of you puts uh, you know takes off your headset, and we go through it. This time, I'm gonna have both of you guys be here, and we're gonna play a little rendition of agree or disagree. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask a question, and I'm gonna ask it to a particular person. Uh, these should be for the most part multiple choice, or at the very least true or false, and maybe a couple multiple choice. The uh, I'm going to ask that question to one person. That person is going to give me what they think is the correct answer. Now, the other person has the ability to either say that they agree with the answer or disagree. Uh, if they agree and the answer is right, there's a total of one and a half points that can be awarded per question. So if I ask the question to Kaiser and he guesses the correct answer and Haddix agrees... Kaiser gets a point. Haddix gets a half point for agreeing. So you guys follow me so far. Yeah. Now yes, on the I agree. on the other Dang on the other end of that, uh, Kaiser, if you get the question correct and Haddix disagrees, you get all one and a half points of that question. Yeah, I disagree with that. Now on the other on the other hand of that, uh, Kaiser, if you get the question wrong and Haddix agrees. No points are given. If Kaiser, you get the question wrong and Haddix disagrees and then also gets the question correct, he gets all one and a half points. Yep. Yeah. All right. Makes sense. I'm with you. You like yeah, you, you like the make sense parts about you get So basically the there's basically there's five points total per question. There is one and a half points per I know, question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. All right. So I got I got the score. I got a little scoreboard here on my side. So Kaiser, since you're you're currently winning overall, I want you to tell me: Do you want to answer the first question, or do you want Haddix to answer the first question? You know, I went first last time, and I won. And I think the time before I went last, and I won. So I don't <laughs> think it really matters. So I'm gonna go last this time. Okay. I'll let Haddix go first. All right, so Haddix, here's your and first agree, question. And I agree with that. So Kaiser gets a point, I get a half point. You, tr- you already want to be losing? All right, that's fine. Let it let, let the record show that Kaiser has a half point lead already. <laughs> so here's question number one, Haddix. Uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson live in rooms at 221B Baker Street, London. What is the name of... Of their housekeeper. Is it Mrs. Grigg, Mrs. Miniver, Mrs. Hudson, or Mrs. Thorpe? Uh, I believe the answer is Mrs. Hudson. Geyser, do you agree or disagree? I, uh, I agree, and I knew that answer without the multiple choice. It's Yes, that is the correct answer. I know that's true as well. Well, then fine. I guess there's no... Uh... There's no, there's no need for theatrics. Yes, Haddock says correct. <laughs> Haddock, you got one point. Kaiser, you're at a half point. So this question is going to go to Kaiser. 
Okay. In which story does Sherlock Holmes' brother Mycroft first appear? Is it the Bruce Partington plans, the Abbey Grange, the Engineer's Thumb, or the Greek Interpreter? Which one of those stories did Mycroft make his first appearance? Uh, we'll go with B. You're going to go with Abby Grange. I am. Hex, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I have no idea. So f- for the uh, chance to kind of one-up Kaiser here and possibly get some points, even though he might be right, I'm going to go with D, the Greek, whatever it was, interpreter. The answer is the Greek interpreter. Ooh, wow. oh, oh. So, so Hex, you're at, you're at two and a half points. Kaiser, you're staying at a half. Not well done, Haddix. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Haddix. Or not. Yeah, Haddix, this is yours. Okay. Pulling it up right now. Which Sherlock Holmes novel is a prequel of sorts to The Final Problem? Is it The Sign of Four, A Study in Scarlet, The Hound of the Baskervilles, or The Valley of Fear. Once again, I'll say him again. Which Sherlock Holmes novel is a prequel of sorts to The Final Problem? Is it The Sign of Four, A Study in Scarlet, The Hound of the Baskervilles, or The Valley of Fear? Uh, again, not 100% sure, but I'm going to go with The Study in Scarlet, I believe is what it was. B or something. Something Scarlet. Kaiser? What's interesting is I've only heard of one of those, and that's The Hounds of Baskerville. Yes, that's from the show, um, TV show. Well, it's also a book. I mean, it, but they oh, made well, a TV, it had an episode, yeah, based yes. off of it. Um, however, I too was thinking the Scarlet one, so I will agree with Haddix. The answer is The Valley of Fear. Okay. All right. So we both get one and a half points, right? Correct. Yeah. So, no. Both okay. of you, the score stays the same. Uh, Haddix, this is yours. No, it's Kaiser's. Kaiser's yeah, is yours. Fine. How did Jonathan Small lose his leg in the sign of the four? Did he lose it in a work accident by a crocodile? Did he have cancer? Or did a bomb blow up and remove his leg? Once again, how did he lose his leg? Jonathan Small. Work accident. Crocodile. Cancer. Bomb. What was this? The uh, something of the four. In the sign of the four, how did John? I will Small go with the the alligator. Well, since there's no alligator, I, I'm, I'm guessing you mean crocodile. Him too. I'm don't just don't don't, don't, don't anger people who are you know who are enthusiasts of crocodiles. Okay, have some respect. So you're going to go with the crocodile, Haddix. Uh, work accident. It is the crocodile. Ah, oh, man, I should have. I was oh. going to agree, but I just did that to be different. You know, you know sometimes you just got to be different. Just really, just get yourself out there, right? Well, unfortunately, Kaiser, you have now caught up. You're only a half point behind. So, Haddix, this question goes to you. Yep. Pulling it up here. There we go. In Arthur Conan Doyle's A Case of Identity, what affliction? Does Mary Sutherland suffer? Is it hard of hearing, asthma, hip pain, or short sightedness? Once again, in a case of identity, what affliction does Mary Sutherland suffer? Hard of hearing, asthma, hip pain, short sightedness? Uh, we'll go with asthma. I believe it's short sightedness. The answer is short sightedness. Mm. Oh. So now Kaiser's got a full point lead with Haddix with two questions remaining, by the way. Oh, I didn't know that, dude. Oh, that changes everything. No, it doesn't. I would have agreed with Kaiser <laughs> on the last one. It's still, still two questions left. <laughs> Anyways, here is the second last question. Kaiser, this is yours, right? Yes. Okay. 
according to the um, most recent study, which was done by Time Magazine, what is Sherlock Holmes' uh, calculated IQ? Is it 165, 180, 190, or 200? 165, I, uh, 180, 190, 200. Give me, I'm going to go with. 180. Haddix. I feel like I should agree just to keep things close. But homie, don't play that. I'm going to say 190. It is 190. Boom! Mm. Ugh, I almost did that. I almost did it. So, here we go. Final question. Haddix, you have a half point lead. Hoo-wee. Oh, man. All right. So, get ready. Here is the final question. In a every every year in England, uh, they they do like a contest for like a Sherlock Holmes look alike contest, uh, kind of like a Sherlock Holmes Day where everyone dresses up like Sherlock Holmes and then uh, they award whoever you know portrays him the best. One of the most notable ones was in 1900. When a certain individual injected himself with this in order to play his part better. Was it meth, cocaine, heroin, or bath salts? Haddix. Oh, heroin. Kaiser. I mean, I if I agree, because I believe it's heroin... I lose if it's if that's the correct answer, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, you you're better you, off. You to have, you have to one. disagree and hope that he's wrong. Basically, yes, yes, right, yeah. exactly. So even though I would have said heroin as well, I'm going to disagree. And the other cho- choices were meth, bath salts, and, and cocaine. 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 I will go with cocaine. The answer is cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> so, that's some shit. Three lead changes leads to a victory for Kaiser. Final score: five Haddix four. Wow! Oh my god! I am, I'm actually proud of you, Kaiser. That was actually really well done. That was one. Of the, that was one of the Thank closest you. ones. That went down to the wire, and not like me you giving I- a free question to Haddix like I sometimes do. Yeah, what happened? Elementary I thought you already did that. Damn it, Haddix. I had a good line and you had talk over me. Hey dude, that's what you get. Just 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 take just take the win and shut up, Kaiser. Alright, so as we spoke earlier, we are going to be breaking down we we played a board game this past uh, weekend, and like Haddix had alluded to it is available on our YouTube and Twitch page for viewing. So if you guys are curious about the game, you want to maybe see how we played it before you listen to this podcast, feel free, or after you listen to it. Maybe you're like, hey, I want to go check out this game. I feel like they've feel already listened to, to go. some of it already before they go over to it. They're already about 15 minutes deep. But you can always pause it. Well, yeah, exactly. They can pause. They can go watch, come back, or they can listen to this and say, you know what? Now I want to go see what they did. And you can go log into our YouTube page or our Twitch channel and check it out there. But that said, for those of you who have no idea what was going on there, haven't watched any of the streams, we played a board game this weekend and we chose the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Jack the Ripper and West End Adventures game. Um, A little background on this game before we kind of get into it. The game was originally started as a uh, game book published by Sleuth Publications back in 1981. It actually won Game of the Year in Germany in 1985. And it was uh, these game books were sort of a choose-your-own-adventure. Uh, if you guys kind of remember those, I, I know I played some Goosebumps ones as a kid, and I think a Mario Brothers one, where you would uh, you know get to something that's like, do you want to go down this hallway or climb a bridge or, you know, 
do this. The next thing you know, you died if you chose the wrong answer. And then you <laughs> this never, never take the blue door. I, I have I have six of those goosebumps choose your, own, choose your own adventures, and every time there's a blue door, if there's another choice, take the other take the other door. There you go. Wise wise words from Hoagland right there. Um, so then after the game book, they adapted it into a uh, video game under the same name in 91. They released a couple of sequels to it. And then finally in 2011, a company, uh, I'm going to call them Isatari. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced or not, but we're just going to call it that. They published a French version of this game, uh, which then the following year uh, was translated into English and then later reprinted in 2015. Uh, that said, um, in the reprint, they, they made the font very hard to read. Some of that was by design and some of it was just bad, uh, bad design on their part. (laughs) Um, they, they wanted to make it hard to read so that when you were reading, when you were turning the pages and you went to read, you know, if you chose this option, option A, you could read option A without your eyes wandering to option B on the same page and it being really easy to see in case you're like, Oh, that's actually what I should have done. Yeah. They, I feel like they meant well with that. Cause that's, that's they, true. Right. They meant well. It just was Didn't work really out. bad. Yeah. Um, that said in 95, the West end adventures expansion was released. Um, and this game we were playing is the particular, this particular game is a reprint of that one. So if you want the original Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, you want an updated, uh, version of that. They're talking about releasing it sometime this year, but it has not been released. The the, early, the latest one was that 2012 uh, or the 2015 reprint, uh, which is hard to come by, kind of expensive. And like I said, the font and some of it's a, a little difficult. So, But the particular one that we have is the West End Adventures. Uh, just was released um, about by now, about three weeks ago. It came, came out around Valentine's Day. They took the 95 game, updated it. They fixed some critical typos that actually made some cases unsolvable. When you would get to the you would get to the um, the solution and you'd say, "How did they come about that?" Well, it turns out they typoed something somewhere else, which totally made it a, a non-existent solution. So they fixed all that. They also added a four-story campaign for Jack the Ripper, which is completely new. So there's kind of a selling point there. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately this game was published by Space Cowboys, uh, which is a publisher known for, uh, they've done Time Stories, Splendor, Elysium, um, and they actually added a couple of people recently, one of them being a publisher, uh, from Isatari, so that's probably part of the reason why they, they brought over the Sherlock Holmes names. Uh, this particular game retails for about 50 bucks. Um, depending on where you get it, Amazon, your local game stores, all that kind of stuff. Now, uh, let's get into the guess a little background on the game. Let's get into the actual object of the game. Uh, it is a cooperative game. The three of us played together, and I tried to. It's 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 a little <laughs> difficult to do it over Skype, but yes, it was Kyle. Kyle did play over the. Yeah, that's true. You did play it over over Skype. So a little bit harder than when you're not into it. Uh, but there's a lot more note taking. Even though Haddix was in charge of note note, note taking, I had to do my own note taking. Uh, yeah. So, what what the idea was is we are all investigators, and actually in the um, realm of the story or the narrative, we we play um, irregulars. Is their name? It's a group of investigators under uh, Detective Wiggins, who is sort of working with the police department, who is also course working with the great Sherlock Holmes and the idea is there's a particular case um, that Sherlock is trying to solve and in turn so are you and the way the game works is Sherlock goes off and solves the case and you're kind of going off and solving the same case and uh, by following leads like I said it's a choose your own adventure so maybe you want to go to the crime scene you follow the lead to the crime scene and then from there maybe interview go to somebody's house that kind of thing. Um, and ultimately what you're doing is you're sort of using deduction and uh, your fellow investigators and discussing things to try to go across the city of London and solve whatever the case might be. 
and you know, I, I guess I, I should say you have a few additional items that you can use with the game. Um, you got newspapers, uh, the game board, directories. directories. Yep. Yeah, and the directory is nothing more than like a phone book listing of, of people and places and where they would be on the, in London to go find them. And then, you know, wherever the location is, you look it up in the book and can interview them accordingly. And so at, at first glance, I guess, this doesn't look like it's not a typical board game. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know. What were your? I should ask you guys that. What was your first impressions? Because I had played the game before. This was both a, a new game for the two of you. What were kind of your first impressions of just the game in general? Like, like before we even started playing it. Before we, yeah, even when we, just when we were starting to set things up, kind of. What was your? What was your thoughts? Uh, I mean, it definitely was not a typical board game. I, even the the the, I guess the play mat or whatever isn't actually even cardboard it it was folded paper i mean obviously very uh well decorated or very detailed um it, it definitely was wasn't a, map, a typical right? board it was, game. it's not actually a yeah. board it's a map yeah 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 but it wasn't on it wasn't on you know like you're like your monopolies and things kind of come on that folded cardboard or whatever the heck that is yeah i mean there's so yeah exactly i mean it comes you open the box up and you've got 10 booklets each one's a new case got 10 newspapers and they and they make the i mean it's all nice material it's not just you know printed computer paper but you have old victorian london style newspapers that looks like a newspaper from the 1800s and like you said there's no dice no cards no pieces it's it's literally a game board and a couple of booklets and some newspapers to go with would it. you so even there really consider it a game board by definition because i mean really it's just a it's a it's map. not a board it's well, a, yeah yeah right no, it's yeah, you're right. You're right. It's not. It's not even a, a physical game board. It is, for for lack of a better game board in the in the thing, it is the game board. I will it's not. I will say the the only thing because uh, you you could say like oh god you don't even really it's a kind of almost uh, uh like the directory or something like that where you can use it if you want but really there were times where where we marked if people watched the video we marked where we went. And I mean, you kind of look at what's around there. I mean, we we kind of did that a few times. So in a sense, it is very useful. I I, uh, I feel like that particular one that we did. I, I I bet you there's other ones that take advantage of the location of where things well, happen yeah, exactly, more, yeah, yeah. much more than the one we did. So I don't think yes. it's a typical game board, right. but I I do think it was. It, it's very crucial to have out, and that's kind of like the main focal point of the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's probably. No more useful than I guess using the directory or something like that, but it is the visual aid you, yes. you best yeah, have yeah. To, yeah. to help you. And the detail was impactful. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely um, it's not typical in the sense of a of a standard board game. From that regard, you know, you're not you know you're not like, hey, I'm going to get the thumb thimble and you're going to get the race car and let's go. You know, there's there's not there's no pieces there's there's none of that. So it might deter some people right from the get go. Like, oh, you know, what is this? This is this is different than anything we'll, you know we're used to. Um, Kyle, how about you? Any, any first impressions before we got into it, to the game itself? Um, I mean, like I said, me, me being still on the other side of the country playing it with you, uh, my first impression was I, I it was cool that it didn't have a whole lot of setup. Like you said, there's not there's there's no there's no pieces there's no, there's no like moving spots there's no start um the rules didn't seem like it was that bad i will say though that probably the first half hour of our stream was probably just kind of getting everybody the understanding of what the game was about and what to do um so it to, the, to that to that sense it's definitely a very uh intense game as far as um you know, I feel like the difficulty of it is 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 looked like it was pretty pretty high, um, especially when you told us that you already played it once with with your girlfriend. And one of the things that you also told us was after you get done solving it or not solving it, it does then tell you how long it took uh, Sherlock Holmes to solve it, and it just kind of just shows that Sherlock Holmes for the most part is going to put you to shame. Yeah, and I mean that's that's just basically how that is when it comes to Sherlock. But, uh, 
we'll we'll get kind of get into to more of that uh, in a little bit. But to to your point, Kyle, there's not much. You know, they give you a rule book, but the rule book is very basic, and there's really not a whole lot of rules to follow per se. You know, it's it's kind of like here's here's it explains to you how how to go through to the game, and you can pretty much do what you want after after you know you're ready to go. Um, so it's it's not. I wouldn't say it's very difficult to learn um, the basics, but it's, it's it's one of those. It's probably easy to learn, but but hard to master when it comes to actually playing the game. Yeah. Yep. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the infamous list twist list segment brought to you by sierra mist insist on the twist and i do have to say our legal department wants me to follow that up with we are in no way associated with sierra mist at all uh they have not allowed us to say that or anything so uh you know has our legal department um our legal department is literally not saying anything (laughs) to do with that list name at all like have they just said like it's just they love the marketing department loves the name the legal department is the one that said we can't say we're uh, associated with CRMS at all. I was so. kind of hoping that you would keep on changing it every week. Well, uh, not a lot of things rhyme with list, which is how we got into this uh, situation anyway. Uh, that makes sense. So we're sticking with the List Twist podcast brought to you by CRMS. Insist on the twist. Dot, dot, dot. Anyway, let's get into this. Uh... I started this off by like kind of looking up a bunch of like top 10 board games, top 10 worst board games yet. And and they're all what you would like figure like, you know, Monopoly, stuff like that, chess, all that kind of stuff. Um, I did stumble across this article on listverse.com written by Rosie Lewis, and it is titled the 10 most offensive board games ever published. Uh, (laughs) So All right. uh, we're going to get into this. And obviously we don't condone any of these games. Uh, some of them are a little bit uh, worse than others. But did, these the, are, did your legal department tell you to say that, too? That was also uh, – yeah, also came from the legal side. Are we going to have um, to change the rating of our, of our podcast because no, of this no, 10 minutes? None of it is vul- none of it's like vulgar language. These are, these are legitimate games that got published, not games that were invented and like people talked about online. These are literally uh, – Games that got published. So, number 10 on this list uh, is Gay Monopoly. Gay Monopoly? Gay Monopoly. Okay. It was released in 1983 by a company called Fire Island Games, and it keeps basically the same mechanics of regular Monopoly, uh, but instead of houses and hotels, you have bathhouses and bars. And all the tokens are replaced, and you have a teddy bear, a jeep, a blow dryer, a leather cap, handcuffs, and a stiletto heel. And it was published by the Parker Sisters, which obviously the a name play on the Parker Brothers, yeah, the Parker Brothers, and obviously uh, the game and the uh, uh, the name. Uh, they got no lawsuit with Parker Brothers over Monopoly, and they had to stop publishing. The game. You know, it's funny is I feel like there's been so many versions of Monopoly and every um, Tom, Dick and Harry out there has made a version of it that I'm surprised that, you know, Parker Brothers went after this particular one. Unless all the other ones pay royalties to Parker Brothers and then they decided not to. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe it was. Yeah. And I'm not sure what the uh, you because know. I mean, every every single iteration of every single television show and movie and, you know, I, I've played Cleveland Monopoly where it was just local Cleveland cities yeah. and things like that. I think they've like I wonder Potter if, Monopoly and other things like that. I mean, right. Mind you, this was in 83, which things were, I mean, True. not horrible, but I mean, it's, different then. Right. I, it, it, it was the 80s. If it came out now, you know, if, if it came it out sounds, now, I would have. It sounds, I mean, rather, I mean, it sounds fairly tasteful as yeah, far as not, like pieces and stuff like that. So, yeah. But, yeah, it, okay. doesn't, it doesn't sound horrible, but uh, yeah, so that's number 10. Uh, number nine, 
uh, is a game called The Sinking of the Titanic. Uh, it was released actually by Milton Bradley in 1975. And the basic or the the concept of the game is you escort all the passengers to lifeboats before the ship goes down. At which point the game shifts gears, and you have to hunt for food and fresh water by drawing cards. Uh, a rescue ship eventually shows up, and players all race to it. The first one there wins the game, and everybody else dies. So again, not <laughs> not horrible, but maybe just a little. No, dis- not at all. The whole you know Titanic. I would, I would play that. I would love to play that little- game. I was going to say, apparently people are a little more offend, of easily offended back in the day. Yeah, again, 1975. And I guess yeah. they they re-released this game in, like, England or something under a game called, like, Aband- it was called Abandoned Ship instead of Sinking the Titanic. And no one cared about that. So I, I think it was just the whole Titanic thing. Yeah, I, I think once you once you actually, like, attach it to, to, to a tragedy that already kind of... Like, you could, you could do a game where, you know, like... Uh, like a building has collapsed and you have to find a way to get out before the building collapses, but you're not going to go ahead and call it nine 11. You know what I mean? Like that would be yeah, exactly. totally horrible yeah, to do. Yeah. yeah. Very distasteful. Very distasteful. Uh, so number eight, when it gets a little racy, uh, in 19, and it, actually it's odd because 1999, you'd think that somebody would have thought this was a bad idea. Uh, underground games released a game called life as a black man where each player starts as a black 18-year-old high school graduate. Players must make moral choices throughout the game and find themselves in a black university, the ghetto, the military, or Glamourwood. And the first person to reach the freedom space at the top of the board. Oh, my wins. God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's, uh, again, that's a, little, a little rough there. The freedom again, space? 19, 1999. It's not like... Yeah, this not is that something this I'd expect from the like early 1900s or yes, something. Yes, exactly. Or, not that yeah. this game would have been. Not that that would have made it okay, but you'd have no, thought in 1999 would have, somebody right. would have exactly somebody yeah. publishers would have been a little more. Yeah, so uh, a, a little touch on that one. Don't know how that got uh, published, but it did. Uh, number seven, a game called "What Shall I Be?" The exciting game of career girls, uh, released by a company called Sel- Selchow and Ryder in 1966. Basically, it's like a career, pursue a career, uh, and it tells you the personality that you should have. Uh, the The big problem with it was the only careers included were teacher, airline hostess, an actress, a nurse, a model, or a ballet dancer. Whereas the same company created a male version of this game where they had uh, careers such as lawyers and astronauts and things like that. So basically, just saying women can't more do sexist in there, you know, because when you first started out, I'm like, oh, that seems like a, a fine yeah, game more, for more young ladies than, to yes, do it. But yes, yeah. I could see the sex. Where as soon as when you, you said it was in the 60s, I'm like, I can only imagine the, the options are going to be like housewife, secretary, or teacher or something <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah, but just a little on the sexist side. Again, something that would never get published today. Uh, Probably it would be it been. would be altered accordingly today. Yes. See, yes. I'm it offended be, because yeah. as a as a male. Why can't I be an actor? That seems kind of crap. Well, see, they might have had they might have had some of those still on there, you know. But like, they didn't have lawyers and astronauts for for the female version. You know what I mean? Right. This year, if so, it was released today, it would be a gender neutral game. It'd be with one all game. the same jobs. Yeah. yeah, it would yeah. just be what should I be, and it would yeah. be for guys or girls. Uh, so number six gets a little bit on the racy side with number eight. It was a game called Blacks and Whites. Uh, Again, released in the 70s, so I guess you could kind of see why someone thought this was a good idea, but obviously not a great idea at all. Uh, And at the beginning of the game, you choose to be black or white. Uh, The really, really just insane part of this game is if you choose a white character, you you start the game with a million dollars and you can buy property anywhere on the board. Whereas if you choose a black character, you start with only ten thousand dollars, and you can't buy many properties at all. And throughout the game, you draw cards from a certain pile, whether you chose black or white. And obviously, the cards are drastically different. So I won't get into the differences, but in, insanely racist. So. Is it, you know, I mean, not, it, it, that kind of game too. Like, what's what's the what's the goal to the game? And I just feel like if you're trying to win, you would even a black person I, I would think pick white a, every time. Exactly, exactly. I, well, yeah, and just from a competitive yeah. standpoint, like, yeah. you know, it just doesn't make any sense to it, choose it, the... Yeah, it's a crappy design. It was, it, it just, it was a, a period of time when we were, 
a very racist society, and yes. they just wanted to kind of flex their racist muscles, if you will. Yeah. So again, uh, just highly, highly racist, but uh, and and a horrible game, like you said. E- even if it had nothing, even if it was like green and yellow or whatever, you know what I mean? It, 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 it just shows it, you that there was actually a target market. For, like someone made this because there was a target market for that. Buying it, yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. exactly. Unfortunately, uh, getting into number five, which is my personal favorite, <laughs> is a game called Busan Mamo. I, I think that's how it's pronounced. I'm not sure. It was released in 2003, and before I tell you the concept of it. Uh, in German, Busen Memo means bosom memory. Okay? And basically, I'm, I'm, I'm already on board. This is a memory game where you flip over the two cards and you have to match them, except for instead of friendly images, you match the right and left breast of 48 different women. I guess you could call it a mammary game. There you go. There. Hey I'm sure somebody. <laughs> um. I, I'm, you know, I, I think that's a fine game. I mean, as far as if you're going to get a triple X sort of game. Well, exactly. Fine. Yeah, yeah. I in mean, in comparison again, to some of these other ones, it's it's tame in its own right. Yeah, I mean, again, you, if you don't want to see, is there a German game, game for the women? Uh, that I don't know. Left and right testicle, maybe. Uh, anyway, number four. Again, kind of going with the whole. Uh, racist thing this is 1910 uh a game called darkies in the melon patch uh where you take up roles of of four dark-skinned gentlemen attempting to escape a patch of melons angry farmers and bearded grandmothers act as threats the path also offers some tempting distractions such as melon races or seed spitting contests i mean i mean mean, none of that sounds questionable in my eyes I, yeah. yeah, I yeah, that's something that today, even if you had like the ancient relic from your like great great grandfather, you would not even want to show your friends that because no, no, so that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that's yeah. A, that's like one of those you know like every once in a while you'll you'll run into like a lawn ornament that is that is very very questionably racist, and uh, that would that that would fall on that same thing. Something yeah. something something from the old days that then was satirical. Now it would be in total bad taste. Yeah, total bad taste. Yeah, exactly. Uh, number three, a game called Project Porn Star. Uh, basically, it's kind of like a card game where there's different piles of cards. One of them is uh, action cards. One of them is like uh, actor cards and stuff like that. And and you basically use your cards to build a movie. And whoever has the best wins. Uh, the the crazy thing about this game is there's an action card that is called AIDS. So there you go. What what year wow. was this made? Uh, that it didn't tell me. This this particular article did not have a date for this one, so I'm not. 100% sounds like sure. it sounds like an 80s. Maybe yeah, like probably. 90s game. Probably. Yeah. Uh, but again, kind of with the 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 Malmory game, not incredibly horrible until the AIDS card. Obviously, that's obviously not cool, but. Uh, but just something you wouldn't want to sell to anybody. Uh, number two is a, a very, very, very highly racist game about five little African American children. Uh, that is not the correct name of the game. Uh, I, I think I think everybody who's listening can get the idea. Uh, it was released in 1950, for what it's worth, and basically yeah, the I- con. What is that? Oh, I've, I was going to say, I've, I've heard of this one before. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the concept of the game is there's five, it, regardless of color, there's five children. And you get a, 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 and it comes with five, like, kind of pop up children, and you get a small pop gun rifle that fires corks. And literally, the whole point of the game is whoever can shoot down the most. So, very, very inappropriate. Very inappropriate. Wow, even for the 50s, that's a little... Yeah, yeah, very inappropriate game. Um, but number one on this list, and I don't know if this was a, a, in a particular order of, of worst, least worst to most worst, I have no idea, might have just been 10. Uh, but their number one is a game called, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Jude and Rouse, which means Jews out. So it was published in Dresden in 1938. and that's accurate. Basically, is a Nazi game, and you roll your dice to move your token into Jewish homes where you collect uh, Jews. You must then escort them to a collection point so they can be banished from the city. The game states, 
if you are the first to expel six Jews, you are the undoubted winner. So again, just highly, highly, highly anti-Semitic. And then 60 years later, they made a, a movie of, of it called Schindler's List. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, this isn't a um, this isn't a uh, a list of great games or games that you should go buy. This is a very, very highly offensive games that it, it actually kind of blows my mind that some of these were released. And like you even said, because that one game was in the 50s, which is, I mean, right. even for that time, yeah, highly questionable for the 50s. And I, I feel like, you know, as a publisher of board games, these are not profitable adventures when they go out and create these you games. Like so. You wouldn't think so. You wouldn't think so. They're not going to make a lot of money. No. No, you, you wouldn't think so. But uh, anyway, so yeah, that was a list by um, by Rosie Lewis, the 10 most offensive board games ever published. All right, so uh, let's get into the actual gameplay of this consulting detective. We kind of talked about the basics. You know, ultimately, we're going to want to solve a case, and uh, while while the game suggests passing the book around to player to player to have each person take turns reading, we kind of had the role of myself reading. Haddox was sort of our note taker, and Hoagie was kind of taking notes and also listening from the other uh, side of a computer screen, so a little difficult at his end. But uh, the game really starts out much like it, an episode or a book of Sherlock or something would play out where you're you're kind of there in 221B Baker Street, and it's Sherlock and Watson and maybe some others, and somebody comes in and lets you know that somebody died, and they kind of retell the story of what has happened or you know somebody went missing, whatever the case may be. And after you read it, it, it sets the narrative there. I mean, you know, and I, I will say it's it's well written. Um, it kind of puts you into the scene. And you know, after the after you read a you know one two three pages whatever it might be, you're kind of that's it. You're on your own. Where you're going? And this is where you start start collaborating with everybody. And the game doesn't really say. I think it says it's from one to eight players or something like that. I personally think this is a game that should be best played with, you know, two to four players. I don't know if you guys agree with that thought or not. Yeah, I, f- I felt like the three. I mean, I think we could have gotten another one in there, but I felt like the three that we had was was a pretty solid. You, you don't want too many ideas bouncing around or too many people yeah, arguing you know, about where to go. You know what I mean? That's what it comes down to is you start arguing too much or, you know, yeah. you, you almost if there's too many people, you know, yeah, if you want to play with 10 people, go for it. But I feel like at some point people start getting disinterested and it, it's just almost, yeah, exactly, it's yeah. almost too much going on or not. An, you know, and some people I are mean, like on the other side of the table, not listening, you know, that's, I mean, with three of us, I constantly kept telling us where to go and you two would vote, you know, would vote against me and then it would be the wrong place. So, I mean, there you go. That's, it's true. We did. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, what, we what, what are we going to do? I mean, you had, you had shitty ideas. So. Uh, that's not true because your guys has never worked. But anyway, I digress. Continue, Kaiser. So, so yeah, so basically what we're going to do is, you know, it says, okay, hey, so-and-so was murdered at this restaurant. And, you know, we can say, okay, do we want to go to the restaurant? Then, you know, we we have the directory. Like I said, it's a big phone book. It'll list everybody's names that could be potential characters. It'll list all the restaurants. It'll list police stations, jails, you name it. Um, you you can you know go through that and say, okay, we're going to go here, flip through the book, find that spot, and then there's another paragraph. And the paragraph might be a page long, and you, you're reading the, all these things. You're interviewing somebody. You know that they're giving more clues, and, and much like any murder mystery, the smallest detail could be the biggest clue, and it might go right over your head. Or you might go somewhere and you knock on the door and nobody answers, and you just wasted a lead, um, which we did many at times. Um, at least a dozen times, I, th- I feel like. There was plenty of them. And, it, you know, um, you can look at the map, and the map helps you a little bit. Sometimes it's there's some proximity involved that may play a role in things. Other times the map's nothing more than just a cosmetic addition to the game um and they you know like i said they threw the newspapers in there and for our case i don't think we used the newspaper at all and i think even after the the game was over we kind of read 
the newspaper, and I, I don't think we found anything. Haddix, do you remember finding no. anything that the newspaper helped us whatsoever? No, no, and no, and I don't think you know when reading the answer, he didn't use it either. So I, I think for our case, it just wasn't necessary. Maybe. Yeah, and I and know when I I like I said I've done two cases now, and the first case I used I did use it. I went and talked to somebody who was presenting it like. It was like a professor that was presenting at some uh, – like he had like a conference or a seminar or something going on. So I went and interviewed him because he had something to do with – he was talking about psychology and like the guy who got murdered was a psychologist. So I thought, Al, ah, we'll go talk to him and see if he knew the guy, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This case, we never once went to it, and I think even afterwards we're like, well, were there any hints in there? And I don't think there was any hints. No, no, I didn't, I didn't find um, it. I don't think either of us did. Yeah, and you know, I will say the newspapers – each case that builds, um, you can use more newspapers for. So, like, if we did the fifth case, we would have five newspapers to, to go through. So um, maybe they'll play a role in other cases more so than this one. Um, and it's just like that. There's also, you know, allies in this game. Uh, Sherlock has his list of, you know, specialists and, and people that he follows through and, and questions and, and leans on for certain you know, whether it's a criminologist, it's a – maybe it's a guy a, like a, a slumlord or, or a guy who knows all like the shady happenings around London. If you need to kind of go go there or here and interview those people, there's a list of allies you can always go to and question. And sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're not. Like I think for us, we went and talked to one of the big rumor mongers around the, uh, the London area and they told us all the juicy gossip um, that helped – I don't know if it really helped our case. I think it just sort of solidified some of the things we knew at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, ultimately this is a team game, and it's it's a cooperative game. And what you're trying to do is solve the case in as few uh, amount of leads as possible. Because at the end of the game, there's going to be a bunch of questions that you're supposed to answer. A main set of, of questions, I think there's four or five of them. And then some bonus questions, another four or five of them, that those bonus questions are, are questions that maybe you stumbled across things along the way, and they're going to give you some bonus points like, oh, what's the name of the bartender, or what, who walked with a cane, you know, stupid stuff like that that doesn't really have anything to do with the main uh, case, but it helps reward you for following some leads. And then... Ultimately, what I want you to do is compare your score to Sherlock. At the end, you tally yours up, um, and then you, you you compare it to the 100 points that Sherlock always scores with the additional caveat that for every additional lead you follow that Sherlock doesn't, you lose five points. And we uh, failed miserably. I think that's the <laughs> nicest way of putting it. We got yeah, negative points. We know points. what weapon was used. All right, we we did know that, um, and and I'll say this: um, I think what we tried to do is there came a point where we had followed so many leads, we had followed a certain amount of leads, and then we probably followed ten more leads and really didn't get anything else answered on our end. And that's that. You'll see that sometimes in this game is if if something just doesn't make quite the right sense, you just keep trying to make it. Find something to, to point you to that exact thing that you're missing. And I, I think what we thought we were missing wasn't something that we even needed to find out. And that kind of – that hurt us, I think. Well, I, once again, we, we, were, we were going around in circles also because we had picked the wrong person. So we were, we were spending the next 12 leads focusing on one particular person to get like the evidence we needed to nail this person. And because of it, we were going around in circles – chasing leads that didn't exist because that guy didn't kill anybody yeah i mean what we needed to do was plant some evidence implicating that person and we would have solved the case much quicker i think <laughs> that would have been the ideal way of doing it um what do you guys think about the gameplay i mean that's sort of the basics of the gameplay you know how did you think how the game played oh uh, i mean i really liked it it, it is very it it definitely had that choose your choose your adventure feel to it, you know, because you could do anything. I mean, we could have picked a random spot and gone there if we really wanted to. Um, it, it was very well detailed. 
I, I will say that uh, at least the places that had clues, there was a couple of leads we went on where it said, like you just spoke of, you knock on the door and no one answered, and that was like the clue. But the the ones where there was details, it was very highly detailed, almost where you're you're trying to remember it all and you end up missing like the one thing that you needed because it was so yeah you, well detailed. You, you know, there's certain times where like we wrote down every little thing that that person told us or that was going on in that room. And then we glossed over one thing, and that turned out to be one of the most major that was the lead. That, yeah, exactly. That yeah. we should have followed, and we, and we ignored it pretty much as a you know one off comment. And we really had we paid more attention to that, we may have we had a th- yep. But I, I thought it was I thought it was really well detailed, very good. Yeah, I mean, ultimately we we had our first suspect was the guy who ended up turning out to be the murderer, but we kind of. We kind of blew him away when his his alibi was like kind of just whatever, and then he just sort of – we ended up interviewing him, and I think his interview went so well that he fooled us, and we just kind of ignored him. We're as horrible well. detectives is what it boiled down to. <laughs> we, we are pretty awful. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think it's a, it's a unique concept, and it, it is one that I'm surprised hasn't been replicated more. You know, it's, it's not something – it's not a – it's not something you see all the time. Like I said, it's it's the choose your own adventure book that they turn into a board game. Well, it's and a lot of work. Was- it's a lot of work to create something like that. It's it's much easier to make an ants in the pants than it is to create <laughs> so, something as involved as, as something like this. So yeah, it, it's I'm sure it took it took a writing team. It, it took you know a, somebody who understands a little bit of the criminal mind, a little bit at the very least, or at least understands uh, how Sherlock Holmes and the mysteries are kind of written. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is definitely requires more man hours and probably more throughput with actual thought than creating what, what I would say would be your traditional board game. Yeah, that's a fair point actually because it is, you know, like I said that this has been reprinted a few times and they fixed some typos and I think they've got themselves to a point where it's it's very seamless because it, it is not it it, it is a it, at least it seemingly to me seems like a difficult style to write because you do have to make sure that the 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 players these you know us the investigators whoever what would make them go to each location and what would happen if we went to a location what if for some reason we just went to this location where we weren't supposed to yet you know how do they how do you vague enough or tell the person what they should know without revealing too much that they might not have found out yet if they hadn't gone somewhere else. So, you know, there's a there's a balancing g- game there. And ultimately, I mean, if we just, oh, let's just scroll through and pick this page and read it, and it's a lead that there's no way we should have gone to, and it, you know, it exposes something else that we hadn't gone to yet. It is what it is. I mean, if you're going to... Yeah, I mean, at that point, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I do... I Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I... I enjoy a lot of the Sherlock renditions. I mean, I you know I haven't read all the books or anything like that, but uh, the few TV shows that they've done, the movies, and uh, it definitely, at least the the one case we did, it definitely holds up to the quality of the the mystery. You know, like you know, I really had no idea what was going on, and then when it is, when it's explained at the end, it's like, oh my god, that makes perfect sense. Which is like how every Sherlock movie is. You're like, once you see it, you're like, oh my god, I. I should have known that, but you didn't while it was going on. And uh, right, yeah, and we're we're sitting here painstakingly writing down notes and discussing theories and, and ideas and stuff. And it's you know we took, I think we took three hours to play this game, and you could take thirty minutes, you could take five hours to play it, and it's not it's sort of how much you make out of it, how much you theorize it and stuff. But like you said, Haddix, it's not you're not going in here expecting. If you want to go play this game, don't expect to solve every case. Don't yeah, exactly. Expect to, yeah. ex- don't expect it to be, oh, after a couple leads, you find out that, oh, this person was seen with a knife, and the next person says, hey, I think they ditched the knife in the cabinet. And then you go to the cabinet, and there's the knife, and there's the fingerprints of that person, and then boom, it's over. Like, they're very, you know, there there is a there is some difficulty behind this game. Oh, definitely. Um, but that's it. I, you know, that's about the simplicity of, of the gameplay. I don't know if there's anything else that you guys want to mention about just, just playing the game itself. Uh, I, the only thing know, I wanted to add was it's deceptively long. I think we already knew going in that this, this could go anywhere between like 45 minutes to an hour and a half. 
but I mean, we proved that our ability <laughs> to overthink everything created a three hour debacle of a, of a game. Not saying I didn't have a good time playing it. There was definitely a lot of, you know, conversation. We were bouncing ideas off of each other. You know, it's definitely a very, you know, fundamentally sound cooperative game. Um, but it's it's also one of those things where, like, you know, doing it, playing any game for three hours can slowly become menial after a while. Or at least I think we all, towards the end, started losing patience with the game itself. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that, and I think that was that's not fault of the game. I think that's more of the fault of us at that point that we just well, one we were trying to we spent way too long trying to find a suspect that wasn't the suspect, and it didn't matter where he was at. Um, and I think had we you know went back to our initial thought, we might have gotten ourselves back on track and, and done better. But uh, I agree, it can take. The game can take an hour. It can take four hours, depending on how much or how little you're putting into it. But that said, when you've only got ten cases, you know if you get three hours out of the game, great because you know then you're kind of getting your money's worth in some aspects. Yeah, that's true. And and you could, in their defense, pause pause your game. You know, I mean, you could play for an hour and be like, all right, well, I'm going to pick this back up tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's not there's no timed right. There's no yeah, timing going not, on or anything like that. Sure. So. Absolutely. All right, welcome back to another episode of The Great Debate. For those of you that tuned in last week, uh, I believe Hoagie came up with a a good uh, uh, trivia, not trivia question, a good poll question on Twitter. And it was, if DC Comics did a pro-registration civil war, which was what our debate was about last week, who would oppose Batman's anti-registration movement and lead the pro-registration movement? Uh, the four options were Superman, Hal Jordan, Lex Luthor, and other. And a 60% winner was Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. I think I would agree with that out of those four. I don't know what you guys voted for. Well, I think for me it was – I would rule out Superman because I don't think – I don't think he would play a role one way or the other. And then I just disagree with Lex Luger because I just – Lex Luger, wow. Uh, I thought you said that. (laughs) The narcissist. I don't believe that he probably should play a part in this. But um, no, for for Luther, uh, I feel like you have to have a protagonist lead the charge. Um, in order to make the stakes be that high, if if Lex Luthor is is leading it, there's already like uh, always already seems like there's a good side and a bad side. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I do agree with with Hal Jordan. Uh, Kaiser, did you vote for Hal Jordan? Uh, no, I voted for other. Okay, you uh, didn't no. let us know who though, did you? No, actually, I think I voted for uh, Mister uh, Mister Lex, Sexy Lexi. Nice. Uh, okay. Because, okay. You know, whatever. Okay. All right, well, uh, this week's great debate, uh, keeping on the topic of board games, is going to be a debate between Kyle Hoagland, Joshua Kaiser, between what's better, digital or physical games. Uh, are we going to stick to like board games or just digital versus physical games in general? Uh, my, my, games. My, mine was on the, the digital board game. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Cool. Um, real quick, just for you, those of you who don't know, um, we will start with Kaiser this week. I don't know who we started with last week, but we're going to start with Kaiser this week. Uh, we're going to have three topics. Kaiser will go first. Uh, you know, give his point. Hoagie can either rebuke that point or give his point on that topic. At the end, we'll have a quick thirty-second recap, and then we'll, we will put a poll on Twitter at Pseudo Nerd Pod, and you can vote for who you think won the great debate. So. Are you gentlemen ready? It's ready as I'll ever be. Our first topic is going to be the social aspect of it. And again, Kaiser is in favor of the physical game. So, Kaiser, without further ado, go ahead. I mean, if this one's this one's cut and dry, simple. Board games, physical board games, were created for the social aspect. You get your friends, you get couples around the table, you guys all sit around. Maybe you get a couple of drinks, some snacks, and you're sitting there enjoying a game of Yahtzee, Monopoly, whatever, 
whatever it might be, and you're enjoying some laughs, and you're getting that social aspect, uh, and it gives you something to do on a weekend night with friends. I mean, that's the design of board games, and it just simples that. A well-designed digital board game can do the same exact thing. Uh, I, I, will, I will just give an example of it. Uh, if anyone's ever heard of the Jack, Jackbox games on PlayStation, uh, they, they, basically it's a collaboration of a bunch of games that I think already have an existing board game uh, equivalent, kind of like a Balderdash or a, like a Trivia Pursuit, but they have it on there. But here's the, here's the thing about it. In order to play the game, you have to use your smartphone as like a buzzer. So already you're taking your your phone, which a lot of times when people are playing games or being social, a lot of times people go to their cell phone and you know are texting or just messing around the phone and not being social. That type of game, as well as others that take advantage of that kind of technology, takes that away and actually uses it as an instrument for the socialness in the same room. So I do agree that the board game has done it for a longer period of time. But with the coming and the evolution of technology, I think the digital board games are finding a very good answer for it. Very nice, gentlemen. Uh, topic two will be the convenience of the digital game versus the physical game. And Hoagie, we'll go ahead and start with you first on this one. I want to be polite real quick and, and go back to Kaiser real quick and say if he had anything he wanted to add on to that last one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, there you go. Kaiser, yeah, you get the re- rebute, rebut. Uh, quick rebuttal is... It's just – it's as simple as is if you can gather everyone in one room, and I know what Kyle described was, was sort of that, that I will give him the um, – if it's a digital game that gets everyone in the same room, then I'm considering it a, a, a version of the physical aspect that just isn't using a physical board. But at the end of the day, uh, I enjoy the, the social sitting around a table with everybody. All right. Well done. All right. So, yeah, now I'm moving on to topic two, Hoagie. Uh, we will start with you, the convenience of a digital game versus a physical game. Okay, so I, I will break this down to, to basically four things real quick, and I'll do it very quickly. Game management, AI, setup and cleanup, and time and time management. When I go to game management, the, the whole point of this is that there's a lot of very, very um, uh, in-depth games. And when you make a digital version of it, you're allowing the software to take care of how the rules are taken care of, whether or not something's an illegal move or not. Instead of having somebody screwing up the rules and you know people doing illegal things and no one questioning it because they've never played the game before. You've got, you've got the software in place where everyone's playing together and going by the same rules and it's being handled by the game itself. AI, hey, do you have no friends? You can still play a game that would normally be with, so, with <laughs> you know, with, would be social and you can play by yourself. Um, so you don't absolutely need to have people to come over and play those games. Obviously, you can, but once again, you have the option. And then finally, setup and cleanup and storage. How many times have you held on to a game for years and all of a sudden you bust it out and you're missing a piece of di- you're missing a die, you're missing a bunch of the cards, you're missing game pieces, things that are integral to the part of the game. You don't have to worry about that with with digital. It's all stored. There is you, there's just no shelf you need. You're good to go. All right, Kaiser, follow that up. He makes a lot of great points, um, but you know when it when it comes down to it, it nothing is more uh, convenient than when you have a board right there. You have the everything right there in your hands on a shelf in front of you. You don't have to worry about. Um, logging into a computer, you don't have to worry about an internet connection. You don't have to worry about um, playing anybody other than your friends. It's it's just a convenient way of, of sitting down and playing a game that it's it's accessible right there for you. I think uh, I think Kaiser, I think Kaiser he just told us not to worry about things that we never really had to worry about logging into a computer. I mean, like I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure that no game has ever been stopped in the history of it because I forgot my password on my computer in order to pull up a game. the 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 whole point of this is that when when you're talking about convenience, everything that's convenient about a board game is trumped by the convenience of a, of the digital version. There are no pieces you can play by yourself. the The time of it. Like every, the, everything about it, you don't have to worry about whose turn it is. You don't have to worry about rolling a 10 and counting the 10. All that's automatically done for you. There's no shuffling of cards. You're ready to go, and everyone's happy, and no one's got to worry about being in charge of the rules. 
All right, good points, gentlemen, good points. Topic number three will be a wild card, and we are going to go ahead and start with Kaiser on this one. Kaiser, what do you got? Ultimately, for me, the the physical game board, the tangible, being able to touch a card, the roll of the dice, the the in person interaction with everybody, it's it's the all the senses coming together. Nothing will will top just being able to physically play a, a game around a table with friends. It's all about the physical, tangible aspect of board gaming that really brings it all together. Hoagie. So uh, thank you, Old Man River. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's another thing that we haven't even talked about. Uh, the price of these games. Uh, I, I actually went back and looked at the top 20 board games that have a, a, a digital version of it that you could play, once again, with friends in, a, in the same room, but it's also available online and you could play, you know, like the way you and I would be able to play because I don't live with you guys. I don't live anywhere near you guys. Um, digital or a risk game is $40. The digital version, $9.99. Game of Life, $24.99. The digital version, 5 bucks. Like to me, if you're going to be able to get the same kind of overall enjoyment of a game and be able to save 75% of your money, I mean, I don't even see where the argument of, argument is in that. Any rebuttal, Kaiser? Yeah, the argument just ends is I don't have to worry about a computer, a laptop, any sort of an iPad or iPhone. I have the game board. I can take it to a friend's house. I don't have to. It, it's right there in front of me. I don't have to worry about anything else. If I spend a little bit more on the game board, great. I can take it with me, and I can bring it wherever I want. Simple as that. All right, very nice. All right, we're going to have a quick 30-second closing for each of you. Uh, You know, kind of uh, get your feelings out there. uh, You know, try to get them voters swayed your way. Uh, Since Kaiser went first on the last one, Hoagie will let you go first on your closing statement. Again, 30 seconds. I will stop you at 30 seconds. And... Now I do understand that there are a couple there are certain games that just they belong to be a physical piece type of game. Not everything translates to the digital side. But with all things being equal, if you're able to get the same exact enjoyment in the game and get the same gameplay, wouldn't you rather have a cheaper, better to manage, last longer version of that game? I say, oh hell yes. Very nice. Man, I thought, again, you were going to wait till like, the exact 30 second mark. Like, oh, hell yes. But uh, anyway, Kaiser, uh, you have 30 seconds. When I say, uh, state your case. And go. The physical game board brings together everything that you could ask for in board games. There's a reason it was created with the name board game. You need a board. You need the the table. You want your friends in that social aspect around you. Digital is great. It's fun to go on the road. It's it's nice for its conveniences once in a while, but at the end of the day, playing around a table with friends is what board gaming is all about. Nice. Nice. Exactly 30 seconds. All right. All right. Well done, gentlemen. Uh, again, for all of you out there listening, please go to pseudo nerd pod at pseudo nerd pod on Twitter. And uh, cast your vote. We'll put a poll up there once the uh, podcast goes live. And uh, let us know what you think, who you vote for. If you disagree with both of them, agree with one of them, um, let us know. All right, so we've we've talked about the gameplay and the objectives of the game. Um, Let's just... uh, finally kind of give our overall thoughts and more or less review the game as a whole and i, I kind of want to i'll ask you guys first you know what was it what was it you liked about the game you know straight up uh simple as that uh at least for myself uh i enjoy the uh the deductive side of it uh it, it was a very i thought it was very fun trying to figure out where you should go trying to kind of break down what you just heard uh, very well written in that sense, you know, kind of gave you a, a, a little bit, but not too much where you were sure of your answer, obviously, because we weren't. Uh, but I, I just, I thought it was very well written for, for a game that has 
no pieces and parts for the mo- you know for the most part anyway. Uh, ve- it needs to be carried by its writing, and it definitely did that. I really enjoyed it. Um, the the mystery or the 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 puzzle or the conundrum was was really good. I've, I'm always yeah, a big fan of uh, I'm always a big fan of uh, co-op games, uh, ones where you know you're getting everybody involved. There's not there's never like you know a competitive douchebag that's trying to win. You know everybody's in it to win it with each other, and I think the competitive douchebag in this game is Sherlock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're trying to beat the competitive douchebag in this sense. So, and I think the other thing I like about it too is that, um, and once again, we only did one ca- one case. So, I mean, I have no basis to back this up. But I, I think from what I can understand with the the multiple uh, cases is that you could just get a hunch or you know really hit a really good lead and you could do a really good job. And then think to yourself, oh, if I did really well on this case, then that just means I'm good at this game. I'm I'm sure that's not the case, and that's actually a really good thing, because I know that for the three of us, we bombed that hard. But at the same time, I feel like if we got a second chance and tried a different case, I think that we could, uh, you know, take a, a different approach and be a little bit more intelligent about it. I feel like you can get better at the game, but at the same time, you also can easily fall into that rabbit hole. Uh, even after you're doing, you know, if there's 10, 10 cases, we could have done all nine and go to that final 10th one thinking, you know, we've got this all figured out and still play badly. Now, for some, that might be a negative, but for me, that's a plus as far as gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. It's, it's you know, for for a whodunit kind of game, every case is different. I've played two of them, so I have a little bit more I can speak on. And the first one I thought was an easier case than the one we just solved. Uh, or didn't solve as the, as it turned out to be, yeah. uh, but the the one I previously did, uh, we did solve it, and I think it was slightly easier. But um, I still don't think every aspect of that previous case I had solved either. So there's there's a lot there's a lot to take in, and there's so many different avenues you can go through that it really, uh, depending on the group you're with and the idea you you know ideas you're following, leads you're following. It kind of every game while you know while you're playing a different case, every case is not only different in in context of the case itself, but how you go about attacking the case can be very different from group to group. And I think it it really it's it kind of it's very open. It kind of gives you the idea, you know, freedom to do whatever you want, which is which is kind of nice. And it's it's also very easy to learn, you know, easy to easy to play. I think from that aspect. Yeah, it's, um, it's it's a okay. game that uh, literally every decision you make matters. You know, there's not like a oh, we'll, we'll just go do this. You know, whatever. It's uh, literally everything you do has to be for a good reason. Yeah, there's consequences if you don't. Yeah. Right, and you know, and some people might say, and I guess it's there's a, sort of a negative. We can talk about the negatives too while we're discussing this. Is it's very hard to beat Sherlock and. That's by design, you know. Sherlock is Sherlock. The guy is 190 IQ, according to a uh, recent study, yeah. I believe, yeah. <laughs> by Time Magazine. Uh, so he's he's very intelligent. He's going to make uh, leaps of logic that just doesn't seem logical right or logical. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so there is an aspect that you're. If you play this game with the goal of trying to beat Sherlock, it may be um, not beneficial to you. You may, you know, you might have more fun just saying, "Hey, we're gonna get, we're gonna set out to solve this case." If we beat Sherlock, great. If we don't, that's okay. Ultimately, we want to beat the case because I don't know about you guys. We knew we weren't beating Sherlock about halfway through that game. Oh god, yeah. I yeah. think I would have felt a lot better had we not beat Sherlock and solved the case than in the situation we went into, it, where we scored our, negative and did not <laughs> solve the case either. And in our case, uh, we go into the game trying to score positive points. That that'd be our that'd be our goal. And, and Once again, we figured out that we we didn't know what the weapon was. So good job. <laughs> we did. Um, one recommendation I, I found was because the. One of the in a kind of a downside to this game, and, and then also just the it is it's the nature of the beast, is the minute you read those solutions or you go to the solutions page to read the questions, you know at that moment the game is basically over because even if you 
if you go to read the questions and you're like, oh, shoot, we don't know any of these. Well, you could go back and keep playing the game, but now you know what you're supposed to solve. So it kind of defeats the purpose a little bit. So one thing I, I had read online, um, uh, and I think it's a great suggestion if you're playing this game, is if you decide ahead of time, hey, I want to solve this case, but I, and I kind of want to beat Sherlock, then maybe do this. At some point during the game, maybe it's after your 12th lead, you're like, I'm pretty sure it was you know, Colonel Mustard who committed this murder, and I, feel, I think he did it because you know, so-and-so was, was sleeping with his wife, right? So you write those down, and you, write, you maybe make a mark that this happened after the 12th lead, that I, this is what I'm deciding. But you know what? I want to keep following leads. I want to keep playing this game. Maybe you, then you, you follow 10 more leads, and then you go to answer the questions, and you could say, hey, I knew all these after 12, then, you know, I kind of beat the, you know, I kind of solved it after 12 leads. You know, it kind of played that way, and you could score it a little bit different while still getting more involved. And then maybe you go through 10 more leads, and you find out, oh, it's actually Professor Plum. I was way off early on. And now you've solved the case, but then you also, you know, different ways of playing the game. Because ultimately, I, I don't think the scoring should be the motivator in this game you know it should be trying to solve the case and in, in trying to uh solve the case with friends i don't know if you guys agree with that that thought that seems like that would be more of like beating the game versus going for the high score and for a lot of people you you want to beat the game but for like the real competitive person who you know is trying to do the best uh, then you have like you have someone who's going for the high score so you, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're just giving an extra layer of competitiveness in the game uh, that you know might put a little bit more pressure. And it's also for people who maybe who are just they think that a game like that is actually pretty easy. If if they spent the time and went to every single lead and every sing- I think if all of us went to every lead and every single option we could have possibly made, we would have ultimately figured it out. And I think that's the whole point: is that yeah, you. You can probably solve all the cases if you looked at every lead and had the notes for every lead. But because you do want to beat Sherlock, you're trying to figure it out without wasting, you know, wasting time by going to every lead. So, yeah, no, I like that that's there. I understand why it's there. It's frustrating that I don't think anyone's going to consistently beat Sherlock. But I think it is an important aspect of it because it, it does it, it. It keeps people from from saying, like, well, there's nothing there's nothing that's, I guess, hurting us or keeping us from just talking to everybody. But really, honestly, there is from a scoring perspective. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying there. And, uh, you know, there, it, it needs to be there, but I, I, I think you can also enjoy the game without. I, I think your suggestion, Kaiser, what you write online is perfect. You write when you think that, all right, this is when I would look, you write it down, keep going. That way you get the most out of the game, and then you'll know if you would have beaten it, and if not, you still got to enjoy it and figure it out at the end. So, Right. And, you know, um, as far as something else I didn't like about the game, I, you know, I said sometimes Sherlock's uh, log, you know, logic is a little over the top, but it is what it is. That's Sherlock, you know, he, he makes those decisions, and at the end of the game, when you read the solution... He tells you in his arrogant Sherlock way, basically, this is what I did. Of course, why I did this. You know, I and, I didn't think that ours was too. And again, you played another one, but I didn't think ours was too crazy for what he did. No, so I'll say this: the other one I played, he made a, a much bigger jump in logic than than I would have. I, I didn't understand why he put those two together. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, what I didn't like about our case is. We were looking for a motive on why the murderer killed this person, and he brushes it off in his solution like, oh, you know, you don't need to look for a motive. Sometimes it's not about motive, and like that was it, and I thought that was like kind of a cop-out response because then they, they do f- – there is a motive that you find out if you follow further along, but Sherlock brushes over that, and I kind of – I don't know. I, I just didn't understand that aspect of it because I felt like there should have been more of a motive, more of an explanation on why it happened than than what they did there. I don't know if you guys agree with that or not. Yeah, yeah. For again, unless you went the route of 
writing down your answer and then continuing, I feel like you would have definitely not beat Sherlock on that version because you would have wanted to find motive. And since he did it and he solved it in five or six, you know, clues, you would have taken 10 to try to find the motive. And he was like, Oh, well, I just didn't even do it. And you're like, well, okay. And then I guess that's cool. So. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's sort of, what I felt there, but, um, you know, that said how he solved the murder itself made perfect sense. And, you know, could have been a route we could have taken and i felt like we started on a similar path as sherlock and then we veered way off and he didn't um i think the one thing we have to like divide ourselves from is that from our perspective we want to be able to get like the beyond a shadow of a doubt who did it how did he do it what was the motivation where i feel like sherlock doesn't potentially need all three of those things like uh, like for sure like just really patched down perfectly into a perfect you know puzzle like i think that we think we Damn, need some alliteration right there my friend you're welcome but once mm-hmm. again i think that's the reason why he cuts it off a little bit quicker is because i think we are all thinking okay this next lead will definitely get us exactly the information that we need to to, to bust this guy and then we do that lead and it's like okay that really didn't tell us anything well then let's go with this guy because we were we were kind of dancing between these two leads we picked this one didn't really give us anything so let's go this next one and then then the rabbit hole kind of happened yeah, we definitely went down some rabbit holes that didn't lead us anywhere either. Oh god, um, yeah. But that's, you know, that's part of the game and I think that's one of the some of the, you know, kind of the uniqueness and the, and the charm about the game is that you will do that kind of stuff. And we get ourselves in the moments like when Haddock's, you know, really wanted us to keep talking to the, go to this one person and Kyle, you and I talked him away from it three or four leads and those three or four leads that you and I decided to take went nowhere and then finally we went to the one that Haddock su- suggested, which turned out to be a pretty good lead, but Ultimately, I don't think any of the leads of those no, leads that, really made a difference. For yeah, us. we were down. We were down the rabbit hole at that point. We were we were going to. Uh, we were looking up the guy's wife. She had a different house and stuff. <laughs> well, once again, we were chasing the guy that ultimately didn't kill anybody, too. So yeah, was, exactly. We, we, yeah, we, yeah. we were really in a bad place. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's and that's you know one other probably negative I think is. Um, that ultimately there's 10 cases and when you when you go through all 10 cases you basically know how how the results you know the solutions so it's really hard like if the three of us went and played this case we just played last night again in two weeks like we're pretty much going to have it solved you know we know what happened so either you got to wait two years to play it when you kind of forgot things and even then i think some of it will come back to you um the game's there's not a ton of replayability. Um, See, I, I don't. I don't think it's a bad thing because I. I don't look at it from how many times can you play it versus for for the price of fifty dollars. That's how much you paid for. It, that's how much the value of the game is. Um, right. If if there's ten cases and they maybe average out to you know let's, let's say let's say two hours, you know that's twenty hours of gameplay. That I'm telling you right now, uh, these other games that we that we have, we never came close to playing 20 hours worth. So in that case, it's worth the money because there's no way that we, you know, we, we may have paid 20 dollars a piece for three different games, and collectively through our lives, we never hit 20 hours of of actual gameplay. So for that case, I I, I think that's I think it's actually a, a positive and not a minus. Yeah, I get that you can't order more cases or like like for categories you can just go online and order more sheets and you can you can play that game forever but i know i i don't think that's a, as big of a negative as 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 you might be putting it out to be i understand that you've got to say it because yes there is a finite number of games and then you're you're basically done not only are you done it's like basically it's a it's worthless because you've done everything in the game you could do right and that's basically my point is i don't think it's not going to deter me from telling people to buy this game and play all 10 cases i'm just saying like let you know after 10 cases you've pretty much done everything this game has to offer which is going to you're going to get a lot of time in, involved and you're going to have a lot of fun along the way but after that it's basically either goes on the shelf or you trade it into somebody you sell it whatever the case may be um how about you guys any other uh positives or negatives that we haven't talked about yet that you want to you want to mention uh, i will say uh and I think you and I talked about this Kaiser before we started playing uh, throughout the entire game. I just pictured Benedict Cumberbatch 
uh, I mean, I sure. Yeah, if you like, and it's you know, you sort of do if you, it's really well written and you immerse yourselves into it. Um, so then you know that's what you're gonna you're gonna picture, you know, someone like that. It, it just that's sort of the the. It's like reading a book Sherlock after you watch a movie. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. So that said, let's uh, let's get into our our ratings here. Um, would you guys rate? Would you guys recommend this to to people? And then your overall, you know, maybe on a scale of one to ten, what do you what do you rate it? Okay, I'll let you go first. So oh, gee, thanks. Uh, for I mean, for me, I, I definitely enjoyed it, and this is also coming from the fact that I had to play it on Skype, so obviously I had that kind of disadvantage, but. I, if I had to give it like a one to ten, uh, it's I'll say this: it's no Carmen San Diego. Carmen San Diego to me is always going to be my ten. So I, I would say I would give this probably like a, a seven, a seven out of ten or an eight out of ten, uh, just for the sake of that. It's a really really good co op uh, game with friends to play. Um, I really really liked it. Uh, for this type of game, if you know if this is the type of game you want. I mean, I think it's I think it's high, eight, low nine. If that makes any sense. Uh, really, really sure. liked it. I, I actually would love to play it again, especially now that we've done one and you kind of get a feel for it. Um, I sh- I would I would play this game by myself. I'd buy it and like do the cases by myself. That, I mean, that's how much I liked it. So I highly suggest trying it out. Uh, I have to agree with you, Haddix. I, I got it about a nine myself. Uh, I said the same thing. If if uh, my girlfriend wouldn't kill me for playing the cases by myself, I probably would. Uh, but I really enjoy I, – I've always enjoyed murder mysteries, that kind of solving it. And I think it's challenging enough where I really like to – you know, it really makes you rack your brain. So I enjoy the uniqueness of it, and I recommend it to anybody who's willing to uh, challenge themselves and, and not be dis- – in the type of person who's not going to be discouraged if they get stumped or they, they do end up – not solving a case or Sherlock totally whoops them. Um, that said, if you're somebody who has a short attention span, you can't do a lot of reading, that kind of thing, it might not be for you. Uh, but outside of that, I really recommend it to anybody. And if you're on the, if you're on the fence again, we, we have a, uh, a stream of ourselves on our Twitch and YouTube page. So go check it out. You can kind of get a, a feel for a case and sort of what it entails. And I, I do recommend maybe playing it with a couple of people. If you do play it, and that said, if you have played this game and you're looking for similar uh, games like it, I got a list of a couple here. Uh, Gumshoe, this was a uh, game back in 91, uh, follows the same concept. It's just set in San Francisco. Uh, it was uh, produced by Sleuth, who did the uh, original Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detectives. Uh, 221B Baker Street. Uh, this one is a easy game. Younger players uh, will enjoy it. Uh, it is fifteen or twenty bucks uh, from Amazon, on Amazon, used from other buyers. I should mention the Gumshoe game uh, is one hundred and fifty dollars on eBay or more. It's an out of print game. Uh, there is the NCIS board game. Uh, apparently, it's not as thematic, but it lets you follow clues and go to different crime scenes. It's eight to ten dollars on Amazon, uh, which is probably what you expect from an NCIS game. <laughs> um, Arkham Investigator. Uh, before you get too excited, Haddix, it is not the uh, Batman Universe Arkham. Ew. It is H.P. Lovecraft's, I have never know how to pronounce the word, but I always say Cthulhu uh, Universe. I think that's right. I think it's Cthulhu. Um, but it's that whole universe, and this is a free-to-download PDF. You can find it online. And this is, they literally took the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective and printed it into H.P. Lovecraft's universe. I mean, you've got the map, the directory, um, all that, it's one case, uh, but it follows the same exact formula. So if you want a free version of Sherlock, that is one you can play. And then, of course, the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Volume 1 uh, is supposed to be reprinted later this year. Uh, no date yet at the moment, but that, of course, will be the um, number one uh, follow-up that you'd want if you're into this game because it will be the same style game. When two other recommendations I had, I know I already mentioned uh, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. Definitely a kid's game, but once again, it's a blast from <sighs> the past. And uh, I, Haddix, you could probably say more about this, but uh, the the Telltale Batman series, 
Um, I know that has a little bit like you know your choices you make do change the way you know the story goes and you know how you end up actually solving the mystery. Even though I think there is ultimately an, uh, like a an ending that always happens, but uh, I feel like that has a little bit of detective sleuthing as well in there for in the Batman universe. Yeah, obviously not as vast as as like the game we just played, but yeah. Yeah, good game. There you go. Some recommendations. Um, And that's going to be the show this week. So for all you PMPers out there, if you do have any other recommendations uh, that follow the similar style of the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, feel free to let us know uh, what those are. You can do that on our Facebook page or on Twitter. And, uh, you know, subscribe on iTunes. Leave us that rating. Let us go up the charts and look forward to... uh, you know any of your guys' thoughts don't forget the twitter poll will be coming out um and then of course we've got our stream kyle you can tell us your stream uh dates and times if you got a schedule there that you want to let the listeners know in case they want to come follow your, your stream. wednesday thursday and sunday uh, i might be doing it more this week because the lady's out of out for, for the week uh i'll be opening up the uh, nintendo switch and playing some zelda breath of the wild there you go so if you guys are interested in the breath of the wild which I hear is just an amazing game. I know I might be tuning into the, the stream myself just to check it out. Go ahead and look for us there. And of course, pseudonerdpod.com for all of our social media and everything else that we might have. And don't forget, we'll have a pseudo short next week, followed by the 90-minute full podcast the week after that where we will break down and preview the WrestleMania 2017 pay-per-view that Kyle, you and I, will be attending live. So that's kind of what we got up on the docket coming going forward. And for at least another couple of months, from the Great Lakes to the Golden Gate, I am Josh Kaiser, he is Josh Haddix, and he is Kyle Hoagland, and we will see you guys next time. Have a good Friday. See you later.